Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Laura Gonzalez. I am a realtor based in San Diego, and I'm also a new mom. I have a seven-month-old named Benny, who's actually in the other room with my husband watching this session. Hopefully, he'll be learning some things soon. Um, but anyways, I am so excited to have you here tonight to learn about this topic. Um, about a year ago, I created a Facebook group called San Diego Moms of 2023 Babies. And basically it was for me to find a few friends that I could relate to, that I could learn from. Um, and it now turned into a group of 1,300 moms, which is insane and I still can't believe it. But the group in the community is so positive, is so supportive. And one of the main goals of the group is to share resources, to, to help each other learn about important topics. Tonight, we're gonna be learning about finance basics for you guys, new parents and expecting parents. We have a very special guest, financial expert, Tanya Torres. She's going to be answering our top questions from the community about everything finance related. So Tanya, welcome. Thank you for being here with us. Could you please introduce yourself? Yes, of course. Thank you for having me, Laura. My name is Tanya Torres. I am a certified financial planner. I have been a financial advisor now for going on seven years. I spent the first six years of my career as a portfolio manager at Merrill Lynch. So I am very well versed in the financial markets and dealing with financial planning and basically all things finance. So I'm excited to be here with you guys today. Um, there is so much information that can be shared that, you know, hopefully you guys can take and start applying right now. And if you guys need any more guidance, I'm here to be a resource moving forward. Amazing. We have a jam-packed schedule with lots of questions from the community. So we're going to get started very soon. But I do want to remind you all that towards the end, we'll have a little bit of time for more Q&A. So if you have a pressing question, you want to make sure it gets answered tonight, please drop it in the chat and we'll do our best. Um, Tanya, again, thank you so much for being with us tonight. We're going to get started. And so we are going to get started with the topic of smart budgeting and savings, family savings. Um, I have the list of questions here. I don't want to get them wrong from everybody that submitted their questions. So the first question is, how do we create a family budget that accounts for both our immediate needs, but also that long-term financial goals that we have as new parents? Okay. Uh, I love this question. I think that number one, um, you know, budgeting is something that's very important, but the word itself, budgeting is a word that tends to scare a lot of people because they associate budgeting with restriction. Everyone thinks that because they're on a budget, it means no more Starbucks, no more Target runs, deleting your Amazon app. These are all things that come to mind when we think I need a budget. But the reality is that when you think about budgeting, you have to think what approach or what strategy is sustainable for me and my family long term. What can I start now and continue years from now? Is me tracking every dollar on an Excel spreadsheet something that I can continue to do every month and still be doing that two years from now? The answer is most likely not. And to no fault of your own, it's just human behavior. It's not how we're built to see money. And as a financial planner, I see even single people say that they're going to do this. They're going to do track all of their expenses on Excel, Excel spreadsheet. And three months later, they haven't even opened the spreadsheet anymore. So as humans, we know ourselves, we know our habits. So if you know that this is not something that you can commit to the long term, don't set yourself up for failure. There are other approaches. Um, you know, so what then are your options? So I like to reverse budget. And this is something that I do with all every single one of my clients. This means that not only do you get to treat savings and investing like a monthly bill, you also have the flexibility to spend and still enjoy life, right? Because nobody wants to feel like they're just working and working. And all they're doing is paying bills and trying to save, but not doing anything else. So what you want to do is immediately after you get paid, you want to transfer money into your savings account and into your investment accounts. Then you want to pay your bills. Then even if you spend whatever money is left over, you've already made progress towards your monthly financial goals. 
Most people do the opposite. They get paid, they pay their bills, they spend, and then they complain that they don't have any money left over and then there isn't enough to save or invest. I guarantee you, no matter how much money you're making, no matter what the income level is of your household, if you do this approach, you will likely never have any money left over because life is just expensive. So this is why I like reverse budgeting and why I think it's great and very effective because you can automate everything. You can set up automatic transfers into your savings, into your investment accounts, and it doesn't require a ton of oversight. You don't have to count every dollar and it gives you a little bit of the best of both worlds. I love that. And I love that you emphasize the fact that we need to do something or choose something that's sustainable and realistic for our lifestyle. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely hadn't heard about the reverse budgeting concept. And I am very excited to apply that because, yeah, it definitely sounds less restricting overall. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, what is the best approach? So, you know, talking about budgeting now for savings, what is the best approach for savings for short term expenses like childcare and then long term expenses such as retirement? Yeah, I think that the very first thing and the most important thing when embarking on this financial journey is that you have to have very clear and defined goals. You have to know what the end goal is that you're working towards. After you have defined what your goals are, you need to determine the time horizon for these goals. So am I, is this a goal that I need to accomplish by the end of the year? Or is this for five years? Is this for 20 years for retirement? This is going to help you determine what type of account to use. So for example, if your goal is saving for childcare and another goal is investing for retirement or investing for your child's future education, those are three different goals. Childcare is obviously a short-term goal, meaning that you're going to be needing to use the money soon, right? So obviously you wouldn't put that money into the stock market because, you know, the stock market is more of a long-term play. It needs to go into a savings account. You can use a high-yield savings account, which will give you some sort of return right now in the interim as interest rates remain high. But you want to just make sure that you're keeping this cash accessible and that you're keeping it liquid, for your retirement goal, you can decide what type of account you want to use. It can be through your 401k at work. It can be a Roth IRA that you manage on your own or any other type of retirement account that makes sense for your situation. And then for your child's education goal, you would use a 529 college savings plan because that's the plan that are typically used for educational goals. So see how without having that clarity of the goals, it's hard to know where to even start, the goals yeah. give you really that starting point and help you determine where to put the money. So this way you determine that and then you can reverse budget, right? Because now you say, okay, I get paid on the first of the month, $100 is gonna go into my child's 529 plan, $200 is gonna go into my Roth IRA, and $300 is gonna go into the savings account for childcare. You can automate it every month. You know what each account is for and what you're trying to accomplish, whether it be short-term or long-term. And it's easy for you to, like I said, automate it so that you can set it and forget it. Nice. I love how you kind of uh, brought that down to a more simple, uh, achievable steps. <laughs> um, definitely what we want to do, again, to keep it, um, to make sure that it's a sustainable process for us going um, moving forward. Okay, so... Regarding 529s um, mm -hmm. and saving for our children's education, educations, what type of education and investment accounts do you recommend? Great question. So if you if your goal is to pay for your child's education, whether that's higher education or even you know K through 12 private school, the best account for educational expenses is the 529 college savings plan. This is an investment account that is intended for educational purpose. So it comes with a lot of great tax breaks if you use it correctly. These accounts are typically state sponsored. So usually you do get a tax deduction for making contributions into one. However, the state of California does not have one. So it does not allow you to take any deductions from it, but it should still not be a reason to discourage you from it because it still has a lot of cool features. So the first thing that you should know is that any adult can open one in the name of the, your, the child. So it doesn't have to be mom or dad that opens it. The plans can be opened by dad, by grandma or grandpa or aunt or uncle. And then also the plans are automatically invested based on the child's age. 
And so the way that it works is that it's assuming that the money is going to be taking out starting at age 18 when the college, when the child begins their college education. In the meantime, the money grows tax deferred. So you don't owe any taxes on the growth. And when at age 18, when the child begins their college, um, you know, when begins college and they want to start taking money out and use it for qualified education expenses like tuition, books, room and board, distributions are 100% tax free. And one thing that I do want to mention is that five to nine accounts are counted as assets for parents on the FAFSA application. Mm -hmm. So the FAFSA will, the application, the government will basically look at you and say, okay, you have extra assets and FAFSAs are need-based. They, they allocate money based off need. So the loophole to this is that you can have an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent open the 529 and then it stays off the FAFSA expected family contribution number completely. Ooh. So good loophole, yes. A few yeah. other cool things about 529 plans are that the beneficiary can be changed. So, you know, when your child is one, two, three years old, it's hard to know what they're going to do in life, right? They can maybe become an entrepreneur, do pursue a trade. It's hard to know that they're going to go to college or to pursue a higher education. So I, a lot of times what I see is that parents are caught in a bind. I'm not sure. Should I then invest in a five to nine? What if they don't go to college? What happens? So one of the, one of the cute, cool aspects of five to nines is that you can change the beneficiary. So if you have other children, you can transfer it to other children. If you don't have other children, um, you can transfer ownership over to even a step sibling, a cousin, a niece, a nephew, even mom and dad can take over the 529 and pursue higher education. And if there is any excess money left in a 529 after paying for college education and expenses, up to $10,000 can be used to pay for student loans. And beginning in 2024, any un unused money in 529 plans can be transferred into a Roth IRA for the for the child. So even if you, they're two years old and you start a 529 plan and when they turn 18, they say, no, I'm, you know what, mom and dad, I'm going to start my own business. That money can then be transferred into a Roth IRA to their name and they can still have, they can be way ahead when it comes to retirement planning. So Obviously, a 529 gives you a lot of flexibility, and it's, I would say, an account that I would highly consider if you are looking to save for your child's education. What a flexible yet powerful account. Absolutely. I did not know all these different options for it, especially the fact that even parents can use it to pursue mm -hmm. higher education if there's money left over. And the uh, 2024 update of you know being able to potentially roll it into a Roth IRA, that is amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Now let's switch gears a little bit and let's talk about teaching our kids about money. So we have a lot of new parents, expecting parents in the audience. Uh, maybe we're not gonna be teaching them right now, but I think it's very important to start thinking about this. Um, what are some effective, effective ways to introduce the topic of money to our children and to introduce the concept of financial responsibility? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love this question. And I have to full disclosure here, um, I am not a parent yet, um, so I do not have the the experience firsthand in having these conversations with my own kids, but I have a very objective perspective just based off my profession and me hearing parents talk to their children about it and seeing what works and what's effective and whatnot. So take what you want from this information. This is just based off my daily interactions with clients and how they approach their children with the concept of money and finances and and the role that I've had an advisor in seeing that and and listening to those conversations. So I would say that it all starts with a conversation. If you are a working parent, talk to your children about why you work and what you earn, what your earned money is able to buy them. You know, don't try to go into debt to finance a lifestyle for your children that is unsustainable. There's a lot of things that kids will remember, but there's a lot of things that they won't. And ultimately they want your time and attention. So instead talk to them about how fortunate they are to have what they have. But if you want some actual takeaway ideas, here are a few that I can think of. Um, number one, I would say use everyday opportunities and everyday situations to introduce the concept of money. So this can be in grocery shopping trips, 
Try to explain the value of money and how you use it to buy things, why you need money to buy food and maybe why, you know, they need to put that toy down so that we can buy, you know, X, Y, Z. These are conversations that you can slowly start introducing to children during the very everyday um, experiences versus saying, I need to sit down with you and have a serious conversation, make it casual, make it so that it's something that it's interactive, that you say something and they say something back to you. You're not talking at them. Um, number two, I would say, consider giving your child an allowance. And again, it doesn't have to break your bank. Just give them something so that they have something to manage of their own, because this can teach them the importance of making decisions and how to spend their money. And the biggest thing with the allowance is that I would say, let your children make financial mistakes, <laughs> but make sure that they're learning from them. If you give them an allowance on Friday, every Friday and Saturday morning, they want to blow it all. Maybe let them the first couple of weeks until they understand, hey, I get an allowance every Friday. And if I spend it all, I don't get any more until next Friday. Right. So this way they're still making their own decisions, but when they make those mistakes, make sure that you have a conversation around why maybe they should reconsider this decision in the future. And I think one thing that can help with that is having like some sort of piggy bank or a savings jar. Encourage your children to save a portion of their allowance or to put money aside into the jar. And then this, you know, goes straight into setting goals. Maybe explain how you know, if you put money aside every time you get an allowance, then you can buy this or you can do that. And this is encouraging your child to set financial goals early on. And again, you're just trying to introduce habits. Don't worry so much about the ins and outs. It's all about habits. So this will teach them the importance of setting goals and working towards them and that they can work towards them. Um, another thing that I would say is also introduce the concept of budgeting, help them create a budget for their allowance, maybe teach them how, hey, if I give you $20 on Friday, look, you can put $5 into your piggy bank, you can go out with your friends, you can do this, and you can still do a little bit of everything, but help them differentiate between what they want and then what they need so that they start forming those thoughts on their own. And then the last one I would say is play money games. There's a lot of games out there that can introduce children to the concept of money. And it can be something like Monopoly where you're teaching them about real estate ownership and what it means to, uh, so make it fun for them, right? You don't want it to be where the moment that your kids hear the term money or finance that they're running away from you because they're going to hear some sort of spiel or they're going to get lectured, right? Make it fun and interactive for them and let them express themselves. Everybody has a different perspective and a different characteristics when it comes to money, children included, even when they're very young. I, I, I don't need to tell you guys that children, even when they're one year old, they already have a personality of their own, right? So let them develop that, but just guide them. Yeah. These are amazing, so practical, so easy to implement. I really love the idea of, um, you know, this time when we're talking about children and money, it's all about ha having them learn the habits and like practice those habits versus, hey, you made a mistake. Um, and if they do make a mistake, then using that as a, you know, opportunity to teach them a lesson. Um, I never thought about it that way. I would, you know, maybe we're also like, how do we make sure that they get it right, right? Um, so thank you for sharing all those practical ways to um, introduce the topic of money to children. I love those. Um, if you are just joining us, please remember that towards the end of the session, we're going to do a Q&A session. So you are going, you can drop your questions in the chat. Um, now let's switch gears to life insurance and estate planning. Um, can you provide some guidance on the types of life insurance and what type of coverage is recommended for families? Of course. So there's two types of life insurance policies that you can get, two very general types. The first is term and the second is permanent. Term refers to you insuring your life for a specific period, period of time and for a fixed death benefit. Most people, for example, will elect a 30-year term. So this means that if you pass away any time during that 30-year period, the insurance company will pay the selected death benefit to your beneficiary lump sum and tax-free. 
Typically, how coverage is determined depends on a few factors, and two of them being any outstanding debts or liabilities and your income. The rule of thumb is that you want to have a death benefit that equals at least 10 years of your income, plus any liabilities that you want to be paid for upon your death, like a mortgage, for example. So let's say you make $70,000 a year and you currently have a mortgage balance of $300,000. So you would maybe want to get a policy with at least $700,000 in death benefit because this is going to give your surviving spouse, your, your wife or your husband that gets left behind 10 years of your income that they can use to upkeep their life, expenses, take care of the children, et cetera. So term policies will buy you the highest death benefit for the lowest monthly premium. And obviously there's pros and cons to everything, right? So the con is that you, there is a risk that you can outlive the policy. And one thing that I always say is that it's never a bad thing, right? It means you're alive. If after 30 years, you've outlived your policy, nothing to be sad over. Um, but after 30 years, your kids will no longer be under age. Hopefully you've used that 30 year period strategically to and pay down your mortgage or pay off, pay it off, invest for your future, and then arrange end of life services, right? Because that low premium to pay for term insurance gives you that flexibility to have extra cash to use otherwise. And based off what I see with clients, most people are okay buying term life insurance and being adequately covered so long as they choose the appropriate death benefit. And then the other type of insurance is a permanent insurance. So obviously it's the opposite of term. It covers you until end of life, but it comes in a lot of different forms and it could be a whole life. It could be an IUL that has recently become very popular due to a lot of more so deceiving sales tactics. And I don't have time to go into the insurance rabbit hole today, but I will say this, these types of policies, like I said, they insure you through end of life through age 100. So they do guarantee a death benefit no matter when you pass away. And they also have what is called a cash value account, which is essentially a built-in savings account within the policy, but they are very, very expensive. You, I just sold a $750,000 policy, 30-year ter term policy to a 35-year-old dad. He's paying about $60 a month. If I wanted to, and then I also quoted him a whole life policy, which is a permanent policy, just so that he can see the comparison, only a $200,000 death benefit would have costed him almost $500 a month. So mm -hmm. big, big difference in price. Um, so one thing you should keep in mind is that an insurance policy is not an investment and it's not an ideal or effective way to invest your money. The purpose of insurance is to protect your income and protect your dependents and you know, your family. So, but permanent life insurance can make sense if you do get, if your family has a lot of extra cash every month, or if you anticipate an estate tax issue upon your passing. But otherwise, um, you know, if you need a life insurance quote or just want to see what the differences are, like I'm happy to help you guys. It varies from case to case based off need, but those are a few rules of them. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, clarifying both uh, types of life insurance. Also, um, there is a lot of hype out there about the there uh, life insurance. And I think there's a lot of misconception and misinformation. So um, again, if anybody has any questions or more specific things about this, we can drop them in the chat or also reach out to Tanya um, after. So let's talk a little bit about estate planning. So can you provide advice on estate planning, including wills and trust? Mm -hmm. Are they the same? How do they differ? And um, how do we keep those assets protected um, in the event that, you know, we pass away and our kids um, to protect our kids? Absolutely. So I am not an estate attorney, full disclosure, but I can definitely go over some of the concepts that an estate attorney will have you go through, through the estate planning process. I would highly, highly recommend that you do work with an estate attorney, especially if you have a more complex situation like you have multiple properties or business interest. Um, but if you have a very straightforward and simple estate, like maybe just one house, no other assets, you guys are W-2 earners. There is a very cool website that I have referred clients to called trustandwill.com. It's a very cost-effective way to get something in place. Typically, an estate attorney is going to run you between like $2,500 up to $6,000 for a full estate plan. Tristanwill.com will do it for like seven hundred and fifty dollars. Um, it's not it's not going to be as thorough as working with somebody, but it is something. Um, and if you want to speak to an estate attorney but don't know one, 
feel free to send me an email and I can connect you to someone in my network. But the first thing that you should know that in the state of California, you need a will and a trust. Your estate it will still be subject to probate, which just means it will go through the court system if you do not have both. A trust is what holds the assets. So it could be a home titled in the name of the trust. It could be investment accounts. It could be savings accounts. Basically, all of your assets go in the trust. And the will is the instructions for how those assets are going to be distributed upon death. And this is where you can be as detailed as you wish. You can allocate every single dollar as you wish, whenever you wish. A lot of my clients make it a practice, for example, to name their trust as the beneficiary of their life insurance policy so that then they can leave specific instructions on how the money is used. And that way, if mom or dad passes away, you know, the other spouse is not just going to go all crazy spending the money how they want. And 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 that spouse has peace of mind that the money is going to get spent how they want it to. Um, other aspects of an estate plan include a power of attorney. So this can be specific to medical, financial, or just general. And what this document specifies is who's going to make the decisions for you in the event that you are incapacitated and cannot speak for yourself. Um, and another document that you will also have through your estate plan is a medical directive. How do you want to be treated at end of life? Do you want extraordinary measures to be taken to save your life in all situations possible? Or do you want to sign a DNR? Do not resuscitate. The, this is where you make those decisions now that you are sound of mind and healthy instead of pushing these decisions to your spouse and your family. And I know that nobody likes to think about these things, but trust me, they happen. We've all seen the news article, the news headlines, the articles, mom and dad die in a freak accident or in a plane crash, something like that. It's better to be prepared than to have something happen and to have, you know, the courts decide what happens to everything, right? And it's better to have these conversations now than to force your family to have these conversations in the waiting room of, of an ICU. And they're trying to figure out what to do, what's gonna happen, and emotions are you know, running crazy. So, and one of the most important documents that comes with an estate plan, especially as parents, is a guardianship plan. And the guardianship plan is basically who's gonna take care of your children in the event that mom and dad should pass. If you don't decide, your in-laws will fight over it until a court decides. And I promise you, everybody says that, no, my family wouldn't. It happens. I see it over and over. Every single estate attorney that I speak to, you know, it just, it, it's a very rough time emotionally and emotions come out, things get said that, you know, people don't necessarily mean. So it will be a costly and emotional roller coaster and something that you don't want to put your family and your children through. I I imagine that you as a parent, you know what's best for your children and you want to decide who's going to care for them in the event of my absence. And that gets decided through a guardianship plan. So all of that is included in your estate plan. A lot of people are under the conception that it's just you know, a will and a trust, and it's about my money, you can actually make a lot of de decisions on end of life, medical, financial, and for your children um, through an estate, the estate planning process. So it's very important for a lot of reasons, but especially for parents. Yes, uh, my husband and I actually went through the estate planning process. And yes, all of the questions involved were very difficult to think about. I'll be very honest. I it was an emotional roller coaster to go through it. And I cannot imagine having to go through it when, you know, something does happen in the event, something does happen and you're already way more emotional. So I think um, we, I, I was a little bit fearful about, you know, answering these questions and kind of taking care of this estate plan. Um, but now that we've done it, it feels um, so freeing and liberating um, because that has been taken care of. So yeah, uh, definitely something that we want to um, keep in mind. Um, as parents, especially. Um, okay, well, the other thing I wanted to address, because we had a lot of people with ones and twos in the chat, which means this topic of finance, finances for families and children, it's very new to them, um, or they've done a lot of research, and now they're kind of in that 
analysis paralysis um, mm -hmm. situation. So what do you, how can you encourage us as new parents to kind of take action? Or if you were to recommend, like, what are the, the next two or three things that we could do um, short term to kind of set up our, our children um, financially? Um, I would say, you know, and this is going to be, a, it's going to sound a little bit counterintuitive, but again, my, my opinion and my advice is coming from a very objective place and a very professional standpoint, based off what I've seen other parents do and also mistakes that I've seen other parents do. Mm -hmm. And the number one thing that I can tell you is that as parents, you have to make sure that your oxygen mask is on first before you put, put it on your children. Because a mistake that I've seen parents made is to pour every single extra dollar that they have into accounts for their children. And then before they know it, they're 40 something, 50 something, and they have only $50,000 in a 401k and nothing else. There are so many things that you can offer and to your children and so many ways that you can encourage them and enable them and set them up for success that is not necessarily handing them a bucket of money that are free. Um, so don't stress if, like I said, life is expensive right now. Don't stress if you don't have that extra money to pour into. I would say you having these conversations, you taking the time to teaching them about money, the importance of it, how to manage it, that is 10 times more valuable to a child than just handing them over a bucket of money that they're not even going to know what to do with. Think about when you were 18, if your parents handed you $50,000 and never told you about it, never said anything, they just happy birthday at 18, here's 50, here's your $50,000 check, what would you do with it, right? So I would say, you know, number one, though, would be set clear goals. Like, what is it that you're trying to accomplish for them? Is it helping with educational expenses? Is it just um, investing in general? so that they have something in the future. So I would say, um, until you have those clear goals, it's hard to take steps. Once you have those clear goals, it's easier to say, okay, well, if I want to put them through private school, then I know I need cash. So it's easier to create a plan then. Um, but yeah, set your clear goals and then start having conversations with them. Kids are sponges. They they will absorb everything that you do. So just be mindful of how you talk about money around them. Everything that you, all the conversations you have at the dinner table, everything that you, how you speak of money is the perspective and the mentality that your children are going to adopt. So don't be that parent that's constantly you know, complaining that they don't have enough, that money is evil. Just be mindful of your conversations and know that your children are going to do as you do, not as you say. So those are, I think, some very important points that I saw, that I saw and that I can vouch for firsthand. You know, I'm a first gen and my parents were polar opposites. My mom was you know, always complaining about everything and anything. She still does now. She lives very comfortably and doesn't need money, but she sits on the couch talking to the TV, complaining about how much money Taylor Swift made during her tour and how unfair it is for one person to have that much money and how the system is rigged. And, you know, and part of that, I had to unlearn as an adult because she just ingrained it in me so subconsciously that I wasn't even aware until I became an adult that I had adopted those. So, just as a parent, just understand that money isn't everything. It does help with a lot of aspects, but there's, if you can give your child support and encouragement and that education that maybe you didn't have, that financial education that you didn't have as a kid, that is 10 times more valuable than any account that you can pass over to them. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I think right now, um, life is very expensive. Nobody can deny that. And, and maybe there's a lot of, uh, fear being instilled in people just because of what's going on with the economy, but it's like, how do we, you know, take that and control what we can control. And then how do we reflect, um, that mindset to our family and to our children? Um, this conversation has been so insightful. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to be checking the chat to see if anybody has any questions, um, you guys in the audience, please drop anything in the chat that you want to uh, maybe have more clarification about or if you have any other questions. So somebody asked um, some clarification on the 529. Can the 529 not be used towards loan slash tuition cost in general? I heard you mention up to 10,000 can be used towards loans afterwards. 
Yeah, so typically the priority of the 529 is for qualified educational expenses. Um, and then you have up to a $10,000 limit to use towards student loans. So it's not meant to just pay off student loans. It's meant to actually cover the cost of education as they're being, um, as they're happening. Okay, so such as, so like- It could be tuition, room and board, um, books, supplies, um, things like that. As they're happening, meaning you yes. can't get a loan and then try to pay that loan off with the 529 unless yes. it's that 10,000. Yes. Okay, got it. Thank you for clarifying that. Can you repeat the 529 and the point about grandparents or aunts opening the account instead? Yes. So um, with the FAFSA application, again, if you are a parent that anticipates that you guys will be making a lot of money even through your child's adulthood, um, I wouldn't be too concerned about this because, again, the FAFSA is a need-based financial aid program. So basically, the government allocates um, financial aid to students based off income needs of the family. So if you're a high earner, you're probably not going to get anything anyways, right? So um, one thing is that if as a parent, you open the 529 on the FAFSA, that counts as an asset for you. So then you, their, your child's benefit is going to be lowered because you have more assets on your balance sheet than other parents versus if it's opened by a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle, they don't ask about assets of grandparents or aunts or uncles on the FAFSA. So it'll be completely irrelevant. It won't count against the child for financial aid. Got it. Um, somebody sent me a question directly. Can you give, can you expand on the differences between using the website for the trust and wills versus an estate planning lawyer? Yes. So an estate, number one, if you have multiple properties, um, if you have a business interest, if you have a lot of assets that are spread out, maybe, maybe also you're in like a second um, marriage, um, I would highly suggest um, investing in an estate attorney because they're going to be able to detail your plan to your need. Um, Trust and Will is a online service that offers estate planning, very basic and straightforward estate planning. They'll help you set up a trust, set up a will, set up all those documents that I went over. But if your situation is more complex, um, it just makes more sense to see an attorney um, to make sure that you're dotting all the I's, crossing all the T's, because the last thing that you want is for a document to be missing or something to be filed, you know, incorrectly and that your assets are still subject to probate because it wasn't done correctly. So typically, like I said, if you have are have one home or maybe two homes in the state of California, you guys are both W-2 earners, nothing crazy. Trust and Will is a great starting point and a very cost effective. But if you have anything more than that, I would suggest seeing an estate attorney directly Okay, for, and for best guidance. Okay, that is trustandwills.com? Trustandwill.com, yes. Okay, um, back to the 529, it's a popular concept and uh, topic for us. Um, what if you're the aunt who opens the account for your niece and later you have a child? Does that impact you because you have a 529 under your name? No, because it's the beneficiary is um, the other, your niece or your nephew. Okay. What are the limits of, for rolling a 529 into a Roth? Uh, $35,000 is the max that you can roll into a Roth and it's subject to the annual limit. So you would roll $6,500 every year until you hit that $35,000 max. Got it. Okay. And then we have one last question, again, related to 529. Um, if you have to use, so does the 529 have to be used at age of 18 or can it be used towards private school before that age? No, the 529 is for any educational expenses. It can be K through 12 as well. Um, the only thing obviously is that it is an investment account. So one thing to keep in mind is that obviously, even if you start putting money in when the baby is born, that gives you, if they start going to private school at kindergarten, that gives you a very short window for the money to grow. So just mm -hmm. something to keep in mind, but no, it can be used for K through 12 as well. Awesome. Well, Tanya, thank you so much. Again, this has been so insightful. Um, I think I myself need to rewatch this whole mm -hmm. thing. Please remember, we're going to send an email recap with a link for you to rewatch, as well as Tanya is going to be 
um, sharing a freebie with us with a lot of good information. So I'm going to be sending that to you as well. And Tanya, just before um, we close our meeting, can you let us know how we can reach you? What is the best way to um, get in contact with you? Yeah, absolutely. So my I included all of my contact information in the freebie, which is my email also included my phone number. If you guys want to um, reach out tonight before that goes out, I am very active on Instagram. My Instagram is completely dedicated to sharing financial content and education and information. And you can find me on Instagram, uh, Tanya underscore T underscore. Amazing. Well, Tanya, thank you so much. Everybody that joined, thank you so much. Your questions were amazing. Um, we are right on time. So Thank you again. We will be following up with a recap. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great night. And thank you, Tanya. Thank you, guys.